here and I think I'll uh, give it a start off to tonight's MDI Biological Laboratory Science Cafe. I want to thank everyone in the room for attending and everyone on Zoom, of which there are quite a few dozen it looks like, which is terrific. Uh, and welcome to all of you on uh, coming in on a beautiful evening like this uh, for uh, another one of our science cafes. I'm Fred Bever. I'm Chief Communications Officer at MDI Biolab. Usually you would see our uh, chief of staff, Jerry Bowers, starting things off. Unfortunately, she's a little bit out of the weather, so we'll have to make do without her. Uh, I bet she's watching us from home. Uh, so I also need to thank Cross Insurance for sponsoring these science cafes this year. A terrific bit of help. And so tonight our subject is how middle-aged behavior affects Alzheimer's later which is a topic that many, many people can, should be interested in. Our guest is Faiza Ahmed, Dr. Faiza Ahmed uh, from the University of Maine. She's the director of the Maine Health, Aging and Lifestyle Lab there. Uh, she received her PhD at the University of Georgia and did her postdoc at Cornell Medical School uh, in neuropsychology. And so you're a both a neuroscience scientist and a psychologist. Is that what that means? Yeah, it's that my PhD is in psychology and then I specialized in clinical neuropsychology, which is brain behavior relationships. Got it. So clinical work means that individuals who were concerned about dementia would come to us for evaluation. And then a neuropsychologist is typically the one that does the diagnosis. Got it. You couldn't hear me at all? Okay, I'll say it again. Um, so uh, clinical neuropsychology is a subset of psychology um, that studies brain behavior relationships. And so from a clinical world, what that means is individuals who have any concern about brain function, either from having had a previous brain injury or concerns that dementia might be happening, or they've had strokes in the past, um, will come in and we do evaluations and uh, a, a clinical neuropsychologist is typically the one that would diagnose someone with a dementia. Let's try seating you a little bit, maybe towards there or towards me, just to see if we can end that feedback. Oh. So say something loudly. Say good evening. Good evening. Better. Better? Yes. It's still a little bit of that echo, but okay. uh, we'll, I think we can live with it. Um, this way you can see the screen. Yes. So you can Perfect. Tell us as well. Um, so why don't you just go ahead? Yep. So uh, I just want to mention this is an informal affair. Feel free to ask questions as they come up. Uh, if it seems like an opportune moment, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed, I've seen some of her work before. She likes to engage the audience, so don't be shy. Uh, Sharon Liscott, uh, who will be monitoring the, the, uh, the Zoom screens, uh, can occasionally uh, give out a question, yell out a question for us that comes from our Zoom audience. So uh, you can, for the Zoom audience, you can put something in the chat or put up your hand. Uh, and we will try to get to your question. So now, Dr. Rabin. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, sure. what I thought I'd start with before we get into uh, health behaviors and things that one can do earlier in the lifespan that can help with uh, risk for dementia is going over a few terms because a lot of these terms can run interchangeably and we have a tendency of saying dementia and Alzheimer's disease together when they are technically kind of two separate separate things. So when we say dementia, it's really a broad category um, for any what we refer to as a neurodegenerative disorder. And by that, what we mean is it's not something that somebody is born with, right? So a disease process that affects our brains later on in life 
and one that continues to get worse. So that's the degenerative part of that word, right? So it continues to get worse to the point where it affects our brain's thinking abilities. So things like memory, attention, language, how our speed of information processing, those kinds of skills um, starts to get affected because of the disease process. And as a result of the changes in our thinking, eventually as it worsens, affects our ability to take care of ourselves. So that can be from complex tasks like managing medications, preparing our taxes, <laughs> cooking, you know, grocery shopping, um, to eventually more what we call basic skills like bathing and toileting and grooming. So all of that together is referred to as dementia. Um, I think a better way of uh, a good analogy is thinking of dementia like we think of cancer. It's a big category, but there are so many different types of cancers. So with dementia, there are a variety of different types of dementia, but the most common type is due to what we call Alzheimer's disease pathology. So a particular uh, disease process that affects certain parts of the brain first. Um, in Alzheimer's disease, that tends to be memory, um, some language changes early, early on. People will say that they have sort of tip of tongue word finding difficulties. People, you may, you may have known individuals who early on in the disease process may have gotten lost wandering off or lost trying to go to familiar places. Those are all characteristic changes that affect particular parts of the brain early on. And that's why we see those changes in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, while there are other types of dementias, so for example, people who've had Parkinson's disease for quite a long time eventually develop what we call Parkinson's disease dementia, Alzheimer's disease occurs in about 60 to 70% of all dementia cases. And so for that reason, oftentimes you'll hear Alzheimer's and dementia interchangeably, but they are kind of two different things. And so what we'll talk about is things that we can do for our brain that helps stave off um, the terms that you might see are all cause dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And so in a lot of the readings that you might have seen and news articles, they tend to group those two terms together. Is there anything that I can answer at this point? How about the sounds issue where people that are able to hear great? Um, you said you weren't bond with it, but isn't it true if your parents have um, it, it, you are most likely a percentage you may get it? Absolutely, absolutely. So the question was, yeah, the question was, um, you know, we talk about Alzheimer's disease not being inherited necessarily or not something we're born with, but then why do we have an increased risk if a family member has it? So uh, the way that I should I should clarify that, thank you for that question, is that you may have inherited a risk factor. And there's a very small percent of all Alzheimer's cases, anywhere between about three to 5% where there's a particular genetic mutation that if you have that mutation, you'll definitely get it. However, what we typically hear about is um, other, other potential genes that might be at risk or just having a family history puts us at risk outside of those genes. And that's true. What, it mean, what, what I mean by saying that you're not born with it is that you don't always have those symptoms, right? So cognitive functioning, all of those things were, were, you know, what we would consider normal at expectation. And then as a person gets older, right, there may be more disease pathology starting to happen because maybe there's a family history. And then the symptoms start to appear later on in older adulthood, older adulthood, which is usually after age 65. Did that help clarify that? Yeah. Thank, thank you for that question. It makes it really confusing because you hear about it in the news in so many different ways. Are there any other questions before we? Yes. Is mild cognitive impairment just a euphemistic term for dementia? So that's a good question. Um, the question was, you know, uh, what mild cognitive impairment is, and basically MCI is is a pretty wide varied diagnostic category for individuals who are already older adults who are experiencing some changes in thinking, but not to the point where it's causing a lot of difficulty and not to the point where it's affecting their ability to take care of themselves. And so MCI is like, like an at-risk diagnosis that individuals with MCI are at a greater risk of developing full dementia down the road. The, the reason that I say it's, very, it's, it's such a varied group is that there are a lot of different um, ways people can 
have MCI. It can be related to um, your visual spatial functioning, which is the area that's not as strong, or it could be related to processing speed that's not as strong as being the, the main cognitive thinking skill that somebody's concerned about. What we know in the literature now is that for people to quote unquote convert from MCI to Alzheimer's disease, that doesn't happen to all MCI cases. So some people may have that diagnosis for the rest of their lives. Some people may have gotten that diagnosis and then it changed in the future. Um, and usually we say there may have been a lot of stressors happening earlier on that may have affected it. Those individuals who have MCI and memory was the primary area of concern and memory was the area that was weaker. Those individuals tend to be the ones that are on the Alzheimer's spectrum, meaning that you happen to see them early before they had full blown Alzheimer's symptoms. Yeah. So and it's another frustrating category because it can go in so many different directions. And that's a big area of research. Um, and that actually really brings us nicely to this concept of modifiable health factors and why we talked about middle age as being such an important uh, uh, age of uh, potential interventions and lifestyle changes. So, you know, when I talk about Alzheimer's disease, one of the things that I like to say is that it's not just something that a person reaches older adulthood and now they're all of a sudden at risk for Alzheimer's disease. Symptoms, you know, when they do appear, do appear after age 65 for the majority of individuals if they have Alzheimer's disease. But what we know now is that even before MCI were to um, become apparent, there's subtle tiny changes happening in the brain decades before the disease is actually observable. And so there's this concept between the clinical symptoms that you see and what disease process is happening in the brain. And we used to think that they were much more uh, linked in terms of the time lag. And now what we know is that there is quite a bit of a time lag before you know, small changes are happening in the brain before you actually see symptoms like memory, uh, you know, difficulty with forming new memories, remembering things that can happen 20, 30 years later. And so for that reason, a lot of researchers have shifted to studying individuals and, and doing research among individuals who are, you know, ages 40 to 65. 40 to 65, 45 to 65, might be a critical period of time where if you're going to make some changes for your, your heart health, and we'll talk about how that's related to your brain health as well, that might be a really crucial time to do it. It doesn't mean that one shouldn't try to make those changes later on in life as well at age 65 or beyond. In fact, there's a lot of literature that says that making some health changes later on is, is still very beneficial. Um, but what we focus in on in our lab is just a little bit of a, uh, uh, earlier time point. Another reason that we focus on an earlier time point is that the drug trials for Alzheimer's disease medications is really poor. It's actually a 99% failure rate on the drug trials that we do have. And so, so much of research um, funding is now pushing towards prevention um, uh, or risk reduction, meaning that we don't really know what's the best way to completely prevent Alzheimer's disease because getting older is actually the biggest risk factor. Um, by the time one's 85, we have a one in three chance of having Alzheimer's disease. However, that also means there's right? 66, 67% of individuals 85 and above don't have Alzheimer's disease. And I think that's really important for us to, to recognize. Um, and so what we're saying here is that by addressing some of these health behaviors, and what we'll talk about today is, oops, is it not? There we go. I get excited about these animations, but then they don't work. Okay. What we're going to talk about today is physical activity, diet, and sleep in particular, um, is that if one is going to get Alzheimer's disease, at least it's going to happen later on in the lifespan for individuals who have been able to stay physically active, stay mentally active, have good sleep, right, and have a heart-healthy diet. I also just wanted to point out um, a couple of these other aspects up here. Um, I mentioned social engagement, so you know, not being isolated, right? having interactions. We know that during COVID, it was particularly harder for older adults who were becoming isolated during, during lockdown, and that you know, had an impact on things like dementia. Um, cognitively stimulating activities, so the way I like to describe this is use it or lose it, right? So doing things that are keeping our brains active. 
So that might be reading, that might be learning a new skill, that might be taking adult learning classes, going to lectures. Yeah, um, attending a science them. cafe. Uh, Definitely uh, attending a science cafe and other things like that, absolutely. Um, and then I, oops. I also have recognizing the role of privilege. So here, what we talk about is, um, you know, there's been a lot of literature that showed, you know, well, individuals who had higher years of education seem to have more protection for their brain. They were able to have more of that pathology before you saw symptoms. And the question was, why is that? And part of it is that, you know, when you, when one has the privilege of going to a good quality high school and, you know, a good quality college, they're likely also entering the job force where they're using their using thinking skills more, right? Um, more cognitively demanding jobs. So they're always using that. And so those individuals are already sort of um, experiencing some protection for their brains. Uh, but as we know that there's also a lot of systemic influences to who's able to reach those levels early on in their lives. And so recognizing that that is um, a factor as well. And then the what's good for the heart is good for the brain, um, something that we say all the time. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is in the next um, upcoming slides. But just to keep me from rambling on too long and be mindful of the time, I'm gonna start with talking about physical activity. Okay. So most of the organizations related to Alzheimer's health, right, including World Health Organization, National Academy of Medicine, um, Alzheimer's Association, uh, and, and so on, uh, have all said that we really should be focusing on what are referred to as these modifiable risk factors, meaning these are things that we can change. We can change how physically active we are. We can change what we eat, right? What we can't change are, is our genetics and getting older right, each year passing by. Um, but these are the things that we can change, including things like not smoking, um, uh, having a healthy cholesterol, right, not having type two diabetes, right. Um, but what we'll talk about are uh, other behaviors that do also impact those things, all of which is good for our brain. So these organizations all recommend 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise, which sounds like a lot per week. Right? It's 30 minutes a day. And what we know is that as a society, we're really bad at being physically active. So if you take a look at this graph here, in the red is basically any country that is, quote, off track. They're no, not even close to meeting the country's goals of physical activity. Um, and it's even worse among uh, adolescents and children. I've read stats as high as 78 to 85% of, of adolescents and children being sedentary, meaning they're not getting engaging in physical activity. Right. And we know that this number worldwide is expected to jump to over one third of the population being pretty sedentary. We're not good at it. One of the reasons is we don't know what we mean when they keep hearing moderate intensity activity or vigorous activity, what does that mean? Does that mean I need to get on my treadmill for 30 minutes a day, five days a week? And if we add up the 150 minutes, that's what it sounds like. Um, and in fact, it's actually easier to get to moderate intensity activity than we previously thought. So the research now indicates that for those 30 minutes, they don't have to be 30 minutes altogether. They can be 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. In fact, um, back in 2018, World Health Organization adjusted their recommendations and said that 30 minutes can happen in 10 minute in uh, uh, intervals, which again, makes it easier to adopt a new lifestyle change than trying to say, I'm gonna be doing 30 minutes every day, five days a week. And then more recently in the last couple of years, World Health Organization has said, actually it doesn't even have to be in 30 minute spurts, as long as you're able to add up to about 150 minutes over the week and however combination you do it, that's fine. And when we think about it, it doesn't have to, you know, exercise and physical activity are kind of the same thing. Exercise just means that we planned to do physical activity to get our heart rate up, to get our muscles moving, right? Um, but really anything that's considered physical activity that is at least a pace of being able to talk but not sing. While you're walking, gardening, mm. doing household chores. I know that when I vacuum, I'm out of breath, but usually by the second bedroom, right? Um, any of these things can count towards moderate intensity. And uh, one of the papers that I'll talk about later that we discovered in our lab was that 
even going from a very slow stroll walking pace to slightly faster. And by slightly faster, it didn't even feel like it um, when, when I tried it out myself. That was the difference between low intensity and moderate intensity. So what I like to say when I bring up this slide, because I think a lot of times it can be a little daunting to think, oh gosh, that's a lot of exercise I have to do, is that you're probably doing way more moderate intensity activity than you even realize. I'm curious. So if you have a step monitor on through your, mm -hmm. you know, your, your modern watch, yeah. uh, does that give an accurate yeah, I mean, you know, really way to assess on, that. Yeah, it depends on the tech. There's been times where I've tried out different things in our lab with like a Fitbit versus a watch. And, you know, all of them have pros and cons. Some of them are great at counting steps. Others aren't so good. My Apple Watch constantly tells me good job for standing, even while I'm sitting. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but but compared to nothing, that's still giving you something. And it's giving you, you know, an actual um you know, step goal that you're trying to achieve. And I find that the little motivating messages that come up like, oh, you're doing well, you know, those things keep, keep me motivated. So I think people tend to do more activity when they do have, when they do have some. Okay, but it's not necessarily going to tell me, oh, I need to sweep faster to, in order to get the, the benefit or not. Right. Well, uh, you know, I know that some watches will have something related to like how much energy expenditure you're doing. They'll say like, like based on calories and movement. Mm -hmm. And so that might be part of it too. I honestly haven't tried to figure out the algorithms behind yeah. that. So sometimes I'm like, are you sure? I feel like I've done a lot more activity. <laughs> so rather than that, I just kind of count in, in my head, um, you know, based on I did this much activity for this amount of time. Yeah, great questions. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Um, you come up with the basics for um, any kind of disease or healthy living. I was hoping that you had some secret formula um, that we didn't know about. And when I was a board member on the American Cancer Society, we found out uh, the the eating was a big a big factor in some countries that were, um, you know, getting diff certain different kinds of cancers. Now, are you finding? What percentages in the different countries? Um, are, are, is it just because they're not exercising and being active or, or what is it? That's a really great question. Um, and you're absolutely right. There's been a big load of research on uh, diet, particularly Mediterranean diet. And what we'll talk about here is the MIND diet, which is a combination of two, uh, the American Heart Association's low blood pressure, or, um, uh, blood pressure diet, the DASH diet, and the Mediterranean diet. Uh, one thing that we do know, and I'm not sure how uh, I'm not sure how much of this is related to diet in particular, but worldwide we have about 55 million individuals right now with Alzheimer's disease. Of that, roughly 60 percent are in low and middle income countries, where we. Large part, oh yes. 60. Roughly 60% of that 55 million worldwide is in low and middle income countries. So we're talking about, which again, that's a wide range too, because that's low and middle income. Um, but if we think about those who are in low income countries and we think about nutrition and what people have access to, we can see how that might be one potential mechanism that increases risk for those populations to have uh, increased risk for something like Alzheimer's disease. It's a great question. So the, the question they're asked also, you know, what's the secret formula here? It's you have something to bring us, yeah. uh, but information. Right, right. Um, and so what I say is that um, it's a boring answer, but the things that we're doing to promote our heart health are the same things that we do to promote our brain health, pretty much. Um, when it comes to diet, what we do know, and it's been shown time and time again, is that our Western diet, what we're used to eating, um, which is roughly 50% fat, um, is the worst diet for us. It leads to chronic inflammation. It leads to poor um, uh, uh, weakening of our blood vessel walls and so on. But we do know that the Mediterranean diet and the MIND diet, both of which are Similar here, let me just pull up this table so we can take a look here. Um, seems to have some protection for the brain. So this is a, um, oh, the, the, the uh, citation didn't come up here, but I can share that on the slides. Uh, what they did in this study, this was a seminal study that came out about seven years ago, and they compared 
people who are eating just the DASH diet, the dietary, um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting what the A stands for, for stopping hypertension. So this is a low sodium diet here, um, compared to Mediterranean diet alone, compared to a combination of Mediterranean and the DASH diet together in the mind group. This was a study of about a thousand people and they followed them over the course of about four and a half years. So these were older adults. By the end of four and a half years, um, those individuals who did pretty well uh, adhering to the MIND diet here, so you can see that there's a score based on how often, the higher the score, the more you've adhered to that diet. So we can kind of take a look and see how well each one of us is adhering to MIND diet. Uh, what they found was compared to DASH, compared to Mediterranean diet, those who followed this particular one, which really the only differences is that this one mentions berries when it comes to fruits. This one doesn't require as much uh, seafood as a Mediterranean diet. Uh, it doesn't say too much about alcohol, it's the same. Um, and this one allows cheese more, so more dairy allowed in this one compared to med diet. People who had adhered at least, you know, uh, to a score of 12 to 15, so the top third of the, the highest scores that you could get. Going through this very fast. Too fast. Okay. So go back and say that about cheese again. Mm -hmm. So cheese is allowed in the mind diet. Yes. It's something that isn't really listed particularly in the Mediterranean diet, but it is something that comes from up here, dairy in the DASH diet. So that was an example of how they were combining those two. And these these scores here. The lower the better. This is a no, no. The higher the better. The higher the this better. means that if I got a fifteen, it means that I was doing all of these things, having whole grains at least three times a week, that I was having red meat no more than four times a week, and so on. Uh, and the mind diet on the other side, but the fifty-five is what? How do you rate that? I mean, the Mediterranean. Yeah, it's basically they were just three different types of questionnaires that they had. And so this one was only out of 10 points. This one was only out of 55 points. This one was only out of 15 points because why make it easy to understand? So really uh, okay. a better way of thinking about it is the percentage, you know, out of 55 people who did, who, you know, ate more than 50% of their diet fit into a mind, a Mediterranean diet still had some protection in their brain. For those who did, um, uh, 67% or higher, so they adhered pretty well to a mind diet, what they found was over the course of those four and a half years, 53% um, of individuals who would have likely developed Alzheimer's disease did not based on their trajectory prior to study. Those who were pretty low in adherence um, were more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. But the thing that is particularly important here is that those who only did maybe half of their diet as Mediterranean, or sorry, mind diet, so I think I got a score of like eight or something, seven or eight. Even in that population, if you were only eating half of your diet as mind diet, you were still protected by 35%. So in that group of people, 35% of them were protected from developing Alzheimer's disease. Right? So essentially what we're saying, in, and what I'm saying in too many words probably is that there's been, and this is not the first study, to, or this is the first study to show this, but it's not the only study to show this, is that individuals who do adhere to you know, Mediterranean diet and or mind diet seem to have more protection for their brain. And we'll talk about why that is in a couple of slides coming up. I think that being in New England, being in Maine and eating more seafood in this part of the country does kind of keep people more uh, more uh, uh, healthy when it comes to their diet compared to where I'm from in the Midwest where nobody eats seafood so. or it's deep fried seafood. <laughs> okay. The last thing I want to talk about, and then what I'll do is um, I have a slide where we talk about sort of what the mechanisms behind all these things are. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is sleep. So we are terrible with our sleep just as a society about one in five adults have disrupted or you know, diminished sleep, meaning they're not getting enough sleep. However, that's probably an underestimate. Most people likely have some difficulties with their sleep. 
Um, and in particular, uh, things like uh, sleep apnea can increase as one gets older, which in, uh, impacts sleep. Um, telling people that, you know, if you're having trouble fall, you know, falling asleep, like compared to what you used to, or if you're waking up a lot, right, these are normal changes with our sleep. Um, other definitions here that I just wanted to touch on is sleep efficiency, sleep timing, sleep duration. All, there's a whole literature on sleep. You can spend your entire career studying sleep. Um, and a couple of my students are, are doing that. And what we know is that our sleep health is bad. As we get older, naturally, um, we, it starts taking us longer to fall asleep when we go to bed, that's sleep latency. Um, our sleep efficiency, how much time did we actually spend in bed sleeping versus how many times did we keep waking up and not being able to fall back asleep, right? Sleep efficiency, um, sleep timing. So people who may be accidentally taking naps in the middle of the day without planning to, right? Or you're sitting, you're relaxing, you find that you're dozing off. Um, waking up not well rested, waking up tired, right? Those are all signs that we're not experiencing good quality sleep. And so that's why I say, I don't think it's really 20% of the population. I think it's much more that struggles in sleep, right? So these are normal changes. Now, abnormal changes are the same things that I said, except that they're happening to an increased degree, right? And we talk about this concept called uh, sleep fragmentation, that it's harder for us to fall asleep, it's harder for us to stay asleep, much more than expected for our age. And what's interesting about this aspect is that some people, we notice this change in sleep early, early, early in the Alzheimer's disease process, before you even see other symptoms like memory change, language change, and so on, before you see the thinking skills change. And so some researchers say, well, this might be an early symptom that we're not catching. Um, in fact, a colleague of mine um, at University of Maine, Dr. Marie Hayes and Dr. Ali Abedi, um, they actually have a small business innovation grant. They created a sleep mat so that you could place it under the mattress. It has different sensors on it. Um, and just looking at sleep movements early on, they were able to differentiate. These are people who already had Alzheimer's disease. These were people who might be in the MCI range. These are individuals where you know cognition, that seems to be no change. Um, really important finding because what we have right now for sleep measures are either going into a sleep study, which is you know, going in and getting all the EEG hookup and that's not always the best way to measure it or you know, self-report questionnaires, which is also, we're not great at describing our own sleep, especially if we're asking about snoring behaviors or things like that. Um, and so they've come up with this really interesting sleep mat that has um, uh, published a paper maybe a couple of years ago with them um, on how that was able to predict uh, whether somebody had MCI versus dementia or Alzheimer's disease in particular. So, so some say, is this an early symptom? However, others say this might be part of the mechanism behind Alzheimer's disease. This might be part of the early many factors that can cause Alzheimer's disease. And there's three primary things that are happening here. When we sleep, that's when our um, glymphatic system, which is basically like our lymph node symptom, uh, system, but for our brain. And it wasn't until not that many years ago that we realized that this was a big system that was happening in the brain. Its job is to flush out toxins, things that might've accumulated that would turn into plaques, get flushed out during sleep. That's when it's most in overdrive. And during deep way, like the, the slow restorative sleep cycles, right? Which individuals with Alzheimer's disease don't get um, early on. This is also a time when we're asleep where we go through this process called memory consolidation which means all the information that you experienced that day, where you went out to eat, what you had to eat, you know, the appointments that you um, scheduled for next week. This is the time that it kind of goes more from that short-term to long-term memory. So again, if sleep is not happening well here, it's affecting your memory. And then lastly, when we don't sleep well, our attention, our focus, concentration, all of that is not so great the next day. So it's almost a three-pronged approach to how it can be a potential mechanism, causal pathway to Alzheimer's. What people say now is that it's bi-directional. We don't know which came first. What we know is that these changes happen early on, and we know that it's also affecting things that increase the pathology in the brain because things aren't getting flushed out. Um, so they likely both have 
uh, influence on, on our, our system. I won't go through all of these here, but best way to improve our sleep is not sleep medication. That should never be the first line of treatment here, but it's what we call sleep hygiene, the different behaviors that we have that in, you know, promote a good night's sleep. And none of these are groundbreaking, right? So you know, avoiding caffeine late, late in the day, right? Sleeping in a comfortable space, keeping a wind down routine. Okay, at this time, this is when I'm gonna turn off my phone and I'm gonna brush my teeth, wash my face, get into my pajamas, kind of going through this sort of relaxation routine, right? Um, always going to bed and waking up at the same time, regardless of whether you have something early in the morning or not, right? And so on. And um, while these things do work, it does take a while for these sleep habits to eventually change and for our bodies to start to notice uh, changes. But sleep hygiene, this comes from the Sleep Foundation, right? Um, uh, has been shown to be the best avenue. Yes. Does do, um, sleep aids influence the, the quality or the, 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 the efficacy of sleep in the three aspects you mentioned? Or... It might. Um, I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn without knowing too much about the, like the pharmacology behind it. But what I do know is that some sleep aids might get you to sleep, but you may not get all those restorative sleep cycles that one has. So um, within sleep, we go through this light phase and then it gets into deeper and deeper phases as the night goes on. Um, there's been some research to say that with certain sleep aids, you might not necessarily be hitting all of those. So you're sleeping, but you may not be feeling super well rested. On the opposite side, those people who have sleep apnea, if they use the CPAP machine the, that you know, gives you continuous pressure uh, um, uh, and, and, and continuous oxygen flow, uh, it can be a hard adjustment to starting to wear those, but every single patient I've ever had and anyone else I've ever spoken to raves about it. So once they do start using it, you might be having the same hours of sleep, but you're getting much more restful sleep. Great question, yeah. I read in one gerontology advice that if you take naps in the afternoon, set it for only 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I see it says avoid naps. Right, so that's a good question. You can have naps. Um, the reason they wanna keep it to 30 minutes is that you don't wanna act, sleep for too long because then your brain will start to think this is nighttime sleep. So a 30 minute, 30 minutes is rough, 30 to 90 minutes is roughly one full sleep cycle. We go yeah. through about a few over, over the course of one night. So I've heard anywhere between 30 minutes and less. I've also heard keep it under 90 minutes. So basically not a full sleep cycle. And when you wake up naturally, wake up then. The reason that they limit how long a sleep thing is, is just so that your brain doesn't think it's nighttime because then now you've thrown off what we call the circadian rhythm, our internal body clock. And it'll be hard to fall asleep later at night if you've had, let's say a three hour nap in the afternoon. Great question. So what's going on here? Why? What? Yeah. What's underlying all of this? Yeah. It's like you knew what my next slide was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we're really saying is that there, there are a few different mechanisms. Um, the mechanism that I focus on in our lab has to do with our uh, cardio cerebrovascular system, our brain and body's blood supply system. What we know is that early on, um, you know, our brain doesn't have any reserves for oxygen or glucose, right? So there always has to be a constant supply of oxygen. This is why people with sleep apnea will also talk about having some difficulties with memory. So not getting good sleep, but they're also not getting steady oxygen to the brain, right? Um, and what we know is that these changes to our brain's blood supply system do happen very early on. In fact, I read one, uh, there was a paper that came out a few years ago that found that individuals who had one particular risk gene related to Alzheimer's disease, so it doesn't mean that they were going to have it for sure, it just increases their risk, um, also has to do with the cholesterol transport in our body and our brain's blood supply system. And even as young adults, their brain's blood supply system was less efficient than those who didn't have that risk gene. Right. So um, some people will say that Alzheimer's disease is all about the blood supply system. Others will say, myself included, that it's likely, right, a combination of, oops, go to the slide here, likely a combination of um, our vascular system 
what's happening while we're sleeping and what's not happening when we're not sleeping well, as well as the role of chronic inflammation. So when we think about early life experiences, right, when we think about development and thinking that development is not just childhood, but it's our whole lifespan, there are things that, that we may be experiencing, stressors and so on, that impact the way that our body responds to that stressor, right? But if that stressor, let's say that this, this particular stressor is being, um, is, is having low income and, and having low food security, right? So there's constantly the, this distress about that, right? There's no end point in that kind of stressor, but our body's constantly trying to fight the, the um, uh, uh, response to stress. And that leads to what we call chronic inflammation, which has bad effects on the body and brain down the road. Um, I think this might be a good. Well, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the relationship between uh, inflammation and in middle age and mm -hmm. its effects. And then we've invited Jim Kaufman of the MDI Biological Laboratory to talk a little bit about work he's doing on uh, stress at the developmental level in zebrafish uh, and how that may uh, apply to the way we live our lives or at least what he's discovering. But just tell us a little bit more and then yeah. Jim, when you feel like you're ready to jump yeah. in, please do. Absolutely. Uh, um, you know, I think a good, the, the, the best example is with diet. Um, when, we, when I talked about the Western diet earlier and how it's 50% or more is fat, right? And, um, in, and within that, there's a lot of trans fat, saturated fat, kind of the, 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 the bad fats, right? Those lead to inflammation responses in our body. Exercise, right, helps reduce obesity. It also particularly helps reduce that abdominal fat that we have. So fat has a healthy role in our body. The fat that accumulates in our belly, though, is not good for us. That's a different type of fat. It's referred to as visceral fat. And it actually is also an inflammatory. There's an, an, our body has an inflammatory response to that type of fat. You may have heard in the in news that people are focusing on waist to hip ratio a lot instead of body mass index. Um, and that really is go looking at how much of our waist circumference and hip circumference differ. So we don't want to be close to one. We want to have a difference there. Um, I want to say that it's 0.9 for women or lower, um, waist being the top number, hip being the bottom number in that fraction and 0.85 for men. Um, another way of saying it, right, is, is measuring your, your waist and hip and seeing if there's you know, a significant difference um, and comparing it to what is expected for your, your gender and for your age. So physical activity reduces that as well and also has anti-inflammatory um, effects going forward. And then same for sleep, people talk about how um, chronic markers of inflammation, you know, uh, that we can see, that says, you know, there's a chronic inflammation happening in the body also increases when we have poor sleep as well. And there seems to be something particular about middle age that's a stronger predictor of what's gonna happen when we're in older age. And part of that has to do with what we're talking about is really a um, stable lifetime of behavior. So if things are happening from middle age and people are continuing to eat the, you know, let's say more Western diet, those 20 years versus if I was just looking at individuals who were 70 and above, I don't know what their previous eating behaviors are. But what we do know is that middle age seems to be a good predictor of what's going to happen in older age. And you also mentioned here adverse effects in childhood yeah. or adverse incidents. Mm -hmm. What's an example of that? So an example of that can be extreme neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, uh, basically in traumatic experiences, broad wave. And interestingly, children who have these um, what we call ACEs, right, um, the, they're at greater risk for developing things like metabolic disease, like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases like coronary artery disease, hypertension, high blood pressure as adults. Uh, now, Jim, you've been working with uh, this arsenic exposure as a, as an insult. Uh, yeah, I can get into that, should I? Yeah, why don't you come Please. on up? Why don't you come on up? We'll make a little room. <laughs> Might want to avoid pointing the mic towards the speaker wherever it is. But, uh, can anybody hear me? Uh, I'll just 
think I turned it on, or maybe I turned it off. Roy, well, if we got them. Is the light be on or off? Uh, yeah, it should be green. I don't know how this works. I use mics all the time. <laughs> He's a musician. I don't use mics. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of advertisements on TV about supplements that help you with your brain and blah, blah. What do you think of that? Yeah. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, supplements, if there's good research behind it, I'm okay with people taking supplements. However, there's also uh, like predatory supplements out there. And so the best thing we can do is when we do see advertisements for them, kind of taking a look through and doing some online research about that particular supplement or that particular company. But it's not uncommon to have things like um, blueberry related supplements, for example, because we know that blueberries have anti-inflammatory processes um, or turmeric pills, for example, where if you're not getting turmeric naturally in your diet, then taking it as a pill has some anti-inflammatory properties, for example. Um, and so it's not really a, a, a yes or no answer I, I, uh, for you, but kind of taking a look at what the mechanisms are that they're reporting from that particular. So Dr. Kaufman. So uh, yeah, I'm Jim Kaufman. I'm a associate professor here at MDIBL and I'm a, a developmental biologist. And for the last 10 years or so, we've been addressing the question, uh, our research, uh, we got into um, research trying to understand the relationship between stress and aging. And uh, we use zebrafish as a research model to look at that. And uh, it, what it, where it's taken us is really down a path that is looking at the effects of chronic inflammation because chronic inflammation is, I think, it's fair to say that is the underlying cause of most of the degenerative diseases that we have uh, in the, the Western world, the degenerative diseases of aging, including Alzheimer's, but uh, many others, uh, many psychiatric problems are also linked to chronic inflammation, neuroinflammation in particular. Uh, I just want to say that we often hear of inflammation as being a bad thing, but inflammation is a necessary thing. It's how our bodies actually um, defend against pathogens. It's also how our bodies uh, uh, heal. If we have an injury, the first response the body has to that is to uh, amount to an inflammatory response, and that kind of kickstarts the healing process. And we know from work here done at MDIBL that uh, this inflammatory response is actually necessary to kickstart the regenerative process. So if you block inflammation altogether and the cells that mount the inflammatory response, you don't get regeneration. So inflammation is not a bad thing. It's a necessary thing. You can say the same thing about stress. So stress we think of as a bad thing, but it's not stress is, that's the bad thing. It's chronic stress. Stress is actually necessary. We need a little bit of stress to motivate us to do things. Uh, if you're out in the wild, in the jungle, uh, and you're confronted with a, a, a lion that wants to eat you, it's going to kickstart a stress response called the fight and flight response, and, and you're going to try and get away. And, and Whereas if you have no response at all, the lion will eat you. So it's, it's necessary for survival. The problem with stress is when it becomes chronic. So chronic stress chronic inflammation, and the two things are linked. And this is one of the things that we're studying with, with zebrafish. And so how are they linked? Well, one way that they're linked is through, we have, our bodies have a neuroendocrine system. Uh, so the brain in response to stress produces signals that ultimately release a hormone from the adrenal glands called cortisol. And you've probably all heard of cortisol as thought of as a stress hormone. Uh, but it also does other things. It's actually something that your body needs to adjust to environmental signals. Not only does it respond to stress, but it responds to circadian rhythms. So when you wake up in the morning, you have high, uh, uh, high level of cortisol that comes up and that prepares your body for the meal you're about to eat and, and helps you digest the food. And as it goes down over the course of the day, so cortisol has got a circadian rhythm. And then if you get a stressor, like if you're uh, attacked by a lion, your cortisol is going to go way up. Uh, if you're injured, cortisol goes up. 
And it does a number of things. It affects your metabolism is one of the primary things it does, uh, but it also helps regulate inflammation. So if you have an injury and you're gonna have an inflammatory response to that, that is, the immune system is gonna go help deal with the injury, but then cortisol is gonna go up and then that's going to help down regulate the inflammatory response. So the whole key to all this is all this is supposed to be happening in a transient way to help you deal with these challenges, environmental challenges, and then you get a response and then the response is resolved. And so inflammation is good if, if it's transient and it's resolved in a timely way. It's bad if that doesn't happen and it becomes chronic. And then because inflammation is, is a response that's mounted by the immune system, which I, I like to think of the immune system as kind of a, a well-regulated militia because some of these immune cells are doing things that are damaging that to, to your cells. Uh, that's how they kill pathogens, for example. And, and so, but if, if it goes up and then it comes back down, you're gonna be okay. It's, it's if, it, if you get an inflammation that goes up and does not get resolved, then it becomes chronic. Then it becomes damaging and damage neurons, for example, uh, and cause, cause cell death. So what happens with chronic stress is you're constantly getting these stress signals that are causing your body to produce cortisol. So cortisol levels go up and normally cortisol levels are supposed to go up in response to this challenge or in a circadian rhythm and then come back down. But if they're constantly be going up, then your cortisol rhythms are affected. And what happens is your cells become resistant to that signal. And so cortisol, which is normally a very effective uh, steroid for helping the body resolve inflammation becomes less effective. And, and you become basically, it's called leukocorticoid resistant. We're trying to understand how that works in, in the zebrafish because what happens when you have this leukocorticoid resistance, you don't regulate your inflammation as well, you become chronically inflamed and chronic inflammation causes all these problems. So um, the, the kind of scary thing is that what happens to you very early in life, adverse childhood experience is an example, but even in utero, if in a developing fetus in a mother who's chronically stressed, there's stuff that happens in development that programs that system and the responsiveness of that system to environmental challenge. So we know from epidemiology that uh, in humans that when when you have these early life adverse experiences or if you're born from a mother who is chronically stressed and because she's in poverty as, as a single mother and, and is at her wit's end all the time, you're going to have a higher risk later in life of inflammatory disease. And among those diseases is Alzheimer's. So there is a link, uh, causal link between cortisol chronically elevated cortisol and Alzheimer's as well as many other diseases. So, um, and there's not much you can do about that when you're that young, but what you can do because of the, the brain is so plastic is with these kinds of interventions, you can mitigate that to some extent. So the arsenic, uh, our lab is funded by a couple of grants right now from NIH to study the effects of arsenic. And, and arsenic is known to exacerbate inflammation. And it's also known to have long-term effects on uh, psychiatric health. And we're using zebrafish to model that. And uh, what we found already, and the grant hasn't been active that long, but if you treat zebrafish with 10 parts per billion arsenic, which is the amount that the World Health Organization has determined is a safe limit. So if you get have someone check your well water for arsenic and they find it's nine parts per billion, that's going to be considered safe by the World Health Organization. Well, if you treat zebrafish embryos with 10 parts per billion arsenic for just five days when they're developing to a, just a larval stage and ready to start feeding on their own, then that affects their behavior in a, in a way that's consistent with them having higher levels of anxiety. Uh, what we found just in the last couple of weeks is if you raise those to adults and then breed them, then the next generation still has effects even though they haven't been exposed. So they're intergenerational effects. Uh, 
And we, we don't know the mechanism, but one of the ways that arsenic is thought to uh, have effects, this is very low level arsenic, is that it, it affects the body stress system. So uh, it affects the cortisol signaling system that I was just talking about. And so we're, that's one of the things we're looking at the zebrafish. One of the genes that we're studying that it's affected by cortisol and it also seems to be affected by arsenic is a transcription factor, it's called KLF9. It, a study came out uh, a few years ago that showed that they were looking at uh, Alzheimer's patients post-mortem to look at genes that were expressed in the brain tissue that were consistent. And KLF9 is the number one transcription factor that was upregulated. So, so Jim, just, so when you're talking about a transcription factor that's upregulated, that means that you're talking about genetic activity that's becoming more right common in those brains of Alzheimer's patients. Yeah. So a transcription factor is a kind of a protein that we study. It's a it's a protein that regulates the expression of genes, and this one is a and, and that's how cortisol works actually, is through another transcription factor called the glucocorticoid receptor. It's in all our cells. So cortisol goes in the cells, it activates this protein called the glucocorticoid receptor that then regulates gene expression, it re regulates gene activity. And one of the genes that it activates is KLF9, which has been shown to be one of the most highly correlated genes with, with Alzheimer's. So, all these things are, right, are related to chronic stress, chronic inflammation, lifestyle. Um, uh, it, you know, one thing that you can do to uh, help uh, mitigate the pot risk of Alzheimer's is get your well water checked. Uh, you know, if you have higher levels of arsenic, you probably want to get that mitigated. Um, and also just reduce the amount of stress you have in your life. Is, is a good thing. And, and the ways of doing that are to do things like have a healthy diet and exercise and strong social support networks. So all these things are connected. And with the, because we do have a good deal of bedrock in Maine, there is some prevalence, heightened risk of, of arsenic as uh, our Disney lab is doing some work on as well. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, I just want to ask you, you, were, you mentioned earlier that you we're going to talk about a paper that particularly mm -hmm. looks at uh, moderate exercise versus heavy exercise. Um, and, and is that sort of what you wanted to wrap things up yeah. with as we as we come That's to the end of the great. hour? Or... I think that whenever um, whenever I give these talks, it can feel daunting because all of a sudden it feels like, oh, there's 20 different things that I need to implement right now. And what I really want to emphasize is that when making these changes, keep it gradual because it's you know keep it simple. Maybe maybe think about two sleep hygiene behaviors that you might want to incorporate over the course of the next few weeks or, you know, reducing red meat by, by at least one meal that, that week, or, you know, having a few extra berries and things that are high in antioxidants and dark leafy greens. Um, but what we found in this paper was we actually didn't even look at vigorous activity or even moderate. We looked at moderate, mm -hmm. um, but we looked at walking pace. And this was in a sample of over 900 older adults from a, a large database that we work with. And what we found was that those who went a very slow stroll pace, um, you know, a couple years later, the, the, the walking wasn't as protective for their brains. Those who walked just a little bit faster, which we called light walking pace, and it literally was a difference between two miles an hour versus two and a half miles an hour walking pace. So very small change. And we found that even that, helped protect their brains more than those individuals who were doing, you know, a uh, low, you know, uh, uh, a stroll that wasn't causing their heart rate to go up, essentially. Um, of course, those who did moderate activity had even better protection. But what I, the reason that I wanted to publish this paper was that when, in my experience in clinical work, you know, we would have these conversations after talking to somebody about whether or not they had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And we would always talk about, here are ways to continue to protect your brain, right? And things to reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke were pretty much the, the things that we talked about there from the, the vascular system. And nobody's gonna tell you that it's bad to eat dark leafy greens or that it's, you know, that smoking is good for you or that exercise is bad. Nobody's really arguing that. Everyone knows that it's not, you know, I'm not sharing any deep, dark secrets here. Um, but there are other things that get in the way that affect people's ability to make these major lifestyle changes, right? Maybe they've never worked out before or hearing 30 minutes moderate intensity sounds like 30 minutes on the treadmill five days a week. And that's 
you know, demotivating. And so with this paper, what we're trying to say is even the smallest change in just how fast you're walking had some benefit to the brain. And so knowing that I think is a, just a motivating factor for people to make these kinds of behavior changes. Same with diet. Don't try to completely change your diet in a short amount of time. Slowly and gradually start to in introduce these things. And when you're changing one behavior, these other behaviors kind of fall in line, right? Exercise also helps with us being able to have better sleep quality, right? When we're eating, you know, a more healthy diet, we're less likely to eat the unhealthy, you know, pro-inflammatory kinds of foods. When we're exercising more, we're more likely to eat a diet that kind of promotes the exercise and the benefits of exercise that we had. Um, so all of them do start to, uh, 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 what's the word? Um, they all start to kind of gradually build on each other. Dr. Kaufman, I have to wonder if one day you could do an experiment where you looked at later life interventions with a zebrafish who you know is predisposed, you've made predisposed to Alzheimer's yeah. later. Uh, and I want to throw things open to the audience as we get uh, through the hour here, particularly our Zoom audience. If anyone has any questions that they'd like to relay to us uh, or anyone in our audience in the room, uh, we have a question mm -hmm. in back there. Do any of your zebra fish have ADHD? Because I have, I have that, and I don't know what stress means. And I have arthritis, and that's inflammation. Right. Um, so I just go, 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 go. And I don't have high blood pressure. I don't know what stress is. I can do more work than a teenager can do. Um. So what's going to happen to me? <laughs> I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> but not, I, you know, I I don't know. I'm sorry if that was a, a flippant answer, but I the thing about this is we we do know that early, that chronic stress can cause lead to chronic inflammation, and arthritis is one of is an inflammatory condition. But these are complex problems so just because you have arthritis doesn't mean it was caused by stress it, you know there are other factors these are all multifactorial things and how that relates you, you have to talk, ask dr ahmad how adhd fits into that we're not studying that with zebrafish that's a i think a, a little bit more complex problem than i have the ability to to work use a, a model system to study I don't know if you have anything to... There isn't too much literature on that. And part of it has to do with the fact that oftentimes um, when uh, when, I, when I was seeing patients, people would say, I think I might have ADHD, but I don't know. That wasn't a thing when I was younger. Um, my father probably had it. My grandfather probably had it, but ADHD wasn't even a term back then. And so we'll see older adults for the first time um, who you realize have had ADHD throughout their life, but are only getting diagnosed now because the, you know, the, the questions are being asked finally and those kinds of things. But the literature in terms of how that might increase risk for um, Alzheimer's disease or any kind of neurodiversity that might ris increase risk, we're still not entirely sure. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, you know, rice has arsenic in it. <laughs> you tell people to eat less rice now, I mean, knowing that, or wash it more. Well, that's the they just changed the label on rice, you know, to wash the rice beforehand. Right. I you know, I don't know all that much about it. I do know that rice from that's grown in certain parts of this country have arsenic because down in the southeast, for example, they used arsenic as a pesticide. Uh, for much of the 20th century and it, the ground is it's in the ground where they grow the rice um, so yeah I don't know that rice is it has it naturally well, Dr. Bruce Stanton he's uh, a uh, Bruce Stanton has, has uh, studied this he's at Dartmouth he's a, a longtime uh, MDIBL visiting scientist uh, so I think you know and I don't know which rice to buy but there are you know I've heard that some kind of, some brands are worse than others. And brown rice is not immune. That's right. That's right. In, in fact, if, if I understand Dr. Stan correctly, brown the husk itself can be yeah. a collecting place for arsenic, but it's really hard to tell as a consumer 
which rice might or might not have been grown in a paddy, was, which was susceptible either through natural reasons or through uh, pesticides, uh, might be at risk. So it's tough. It's a tough grain to but haul. It is a good idea to wash it. <laughs> yeah. Sharon, any questions coming from our Zoom audience? Okay. Um, oh, here's, here's a question. Chris Smith. I'm curious about um, the intersection between menopause and um, Alzheimer's because you say that that middle of age sleep disorder is a predictive, but there's this major confounding thing that's happening for people going through that. Um, so what's that uh, connection there? Yeah, no, great question. So there's, you know, prior to menopause, women are at a decreased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. After menopause, women are at an increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And that's after you control for lifespan, you know, women living longer than men. That aside, they're still at a much uh, greater increase. And um, the uh, particular pathologic markers that are often looked at, um, amyloid beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles within the cell, um, it seems that women who have one particular risk allele tend to develop the tangles more than the plaques early on. But um, long story short, it, there seems to be something about estrogen that once that is decreasing, all of a sudden the risk has gone up. And so there's a lot of research looking at hormone replacement therapy um, and, and that sort of thing, because that's such a big shift um, in our brain, or sorry, brain and body, um, in addition to all these kind of behavioral changes that are happening, just responding to being able to sleep through the night with night sweats and those kinds of things um, that's been looked at. And so middle age is another, like you said, a really key time frame, a critical time period um, where other changes are, are helpful. Okay, well, I wondered, um, Dr. Ahmed, uh, I, I imagine some people would want to see all these slides and sort of go through them would we be able to Absolutely. so we can we can work to, to get those out when yeah. we usually we do a follow-up email with all of our uh everyone in our audience and and all of our guests on zoom so we'll we'll, we'll put that out there and i'd like to thank uh dr jim kaufman of mdi biolab for joining us and bringing his expertise here and dr faiz ahmed of the university of maine thank you so much thank both you of you for, for coming to that We do have coming up uh, next month on September 9th, uh, a science cafe with Dr. Cinda Scott, who is an alum of uh, the MDI Bio Lab. She was, uh, I think, an RA here for quite a while. And uh, there's actually one on August 26th. Ah, there is one on August 26th, which is before that, which is one of our arts science cafes uh, at 5 p.m. I presume that that's going to be uh, a hybrid he, it's a hybrid, both online and Zoom. Uh, and uh, Dr. Holler, I'm sure, will be uh, deeply involved with that, and perhaps our artist in residence, uh, uh, Michael Takeo Magruder. Uh, so look on our website, mdibl.org, to find out information about that and about the September Cafe. Uh, and Dr. Scott, she runs a field studies program in Panama. And she also was publishing research on equity and uh, justice in uh, ocean governance. Uh, and so we'll be looking at government and governance and conservation and equity issues uh, as it relates to science uh, in that cafe on Monday, September 9th. So thanks everyone for taking part. Appreciate it. Thank you.